have some great news for you. I have 177 slides. I yeah, I could just, you know, you can really tell how old it is by saying that to someone. If it's a kid, you say, you want to see a slideshow? They're like, oh my gosh, yes. I'm going down Superman. I'm going down on my butt. What? We'll go down together. We'll do a toboggan. It'll be great. You tell an adult you're going to do a slideshow, completely different. No, please, no more bullets. And, and I, you know, it's real easy to blame PowerPoint. We always have misused new technologies, but it's not PowerPoint point's fault. The fault really is the bullet. And I, I recommend you save the bullets because here's the thing. Soon as someone puts bullets up on screen, you stop listening. It, it, it happens when you were a little kid, you would read the cereal box again and again every morning. Didn't matter. You knew what it was there, but you would read it. And so if words are on the screen, people are reading that instead of listening to you. So don't put words on the screen if they want them to listen. Now, the other thing you can't do is a read to them. A lot of people will read the slides to you. This isn't story time. My rule of thumb is six words per slide, something you can glance at, digest, and keep moving on. I think that's a really good idea. Uh, if, it were, if it's worthy of two bullets, it's worthy of two slides. One idea per slide. That way you have their attention while you're talking about that idea. I, I like to think of my slides as Flava Flav. Okay? You don't go to a public enemy concert to listen to Flava Flav. You want to hear what Chuck D has to say. Flava Flav is, you know, yeah, boy. You know, that's, what, that's what your slides are. For the white people in the room, it's Michael Scott. Your slides are just there to say, that's what he said, okay? And then you can move on. Another big problem we have when we build slideshows is we'll put up these eye charts. You can't see, but what this chart is showing, you just told me I can't see. Why are you putting it up there? Okay? Another challenge is with our computers now, we have so many fonts and they're so pretty and cute. Fonts and presentations are like arms. If you have more than two per slide, you've got a problem, okay? Make sure you're only using two, two fonts at a time. Make the logo bigger is something we always worry about in marketing design. But when you're doing slide design, it's make the font bigger. Don't do the eye chart again. Make it easy to read. When I design billboards or postcards for for entrepreneurs, sometimes they'll say, I'm not paying for white space. Fill that in. You, you got more room. And people will do that in their slides, too. They'll chuck the slide with everything, every piece of information they've ever learned. That's not what your slides are for, either. Another uh, thing we have in our toolbox is animations. Ooh, let's make everything animate across the screen. How cool is this? You are not Pixar. You don't need to animate everything. But on the other hand, you are Pixar. You are a storyteller. And soon as you stop being engaging with that story, everyone in the audience has squirrel's disease. Squirrel! And we are easily distracted by that phone. That phone, oh, we just want to look at the screen and see what notifications have come in. Another challenge we have is we really want to feel smart when we're up presenting. So we use jargon and, and lingo that's big in our industry. And so the whole audience, anyone new in the room, starting to tilt their head sideways. Your job is not to make you look smart. Your job is to make your audience look smart. Be understandable. Help find ways to communicate complex ideas simply. That's enough on my soapbox for now. A little bit about me. My name is Charlie Wahlberg. No one uses Wahlberg. They just go by Charlie Curve if you're on Twitter. My company is called Curve Detroit. We do marketing and design and, and social technology. But our soundbite is we help companies turn heads, capture hearts, and sell more stuff. I was a musician, and I got very few dates in this band. I joined Brave New Worlds, we talked about earlier. Did slightly better. Met my wife. She's a great cook. My leather pants don't fit anymore. Uh, so now I do this. Uh, this is my wife, Elena. As soon as I had the kids, you know, had them working for the company right away, because everyone wants to look at cute kids and dogs. So throw them on screen whenever possible. I write children's books, uh, Mocha Boca series. And um, what else do I have to say? That's it. Perfect day for me is a blue sky on top of a big mountain because it's the one sport where gravity is finally in my favor. Favorite place to ski? Go ahead. Uh, oh. 
Mary Jane is just, oh, yeah, tell your ride, tell your ride. Best queso, good grilled cheese. Tell your ride's great. You got to get out the Whistler. Whistler. With you. Anyhow, sorry. <laughs> Hold on, let's just talk about skiing. This would be way better. Let's talk about Cornelius Vanderbilt. What an exciting topic. Yes. Uh, he was uh, the person who invented uh, designer jeans, Vanderbilt jeans. Can't, no, wrong guy. Uh, different guy. In 1810, uh, Vanderbilt ran a schooner company. He was basically a, a taxi driver, ferrying passengers across New York Harbor in a schooner. New technology comes along in 1820, the steamship. Now, you needed a license from the state of New York to have a steamship line. But like any good marketer, rather than asking for permission, he decided to ask for forgiveness. He had a steamship. He ran a more efficient line than anyone else, put them out of business. And eventually he grew into a major uh, ferry company all up and down the East Coast. By 1840, he is dominant in this industry. He could have retired and his kids would be set and you know, would have had a nice scholarship in his name. But he decided to invest in a ridiculous idea. Someone's talking about these iron horses, like, what the fuck are you thinking about? And like, no, 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 you got to listen to me. He sells his ships and invests in these iron horses. By 1860, now he's got generational wealth. Because he realized he was never in the schooner business or the steamer business or the train business. He was moving people and moving cargo, invested in whatever technology to help him get that done. Innovation is nothing other than combining old ideas in new and exciting ways. You have to look at what's coming from other industries and cross-pollinate those ideas so you can come up with something great for your business. I want to talk about another steamship. Um, I don't want to spoil it. If you haven't seen Titanic, just kind of like earmuff for a few seconds. Okay. So they wrong frozen uh they they hit this iceberg and the ship goes down but it's like jim carrey in front of the steamroller in in ace ventura there's a lot of time to react but they sidebar i hate this woman okay that blue diamond talk about generational wealth she could have funded scholarships she could have built a homeless shelter she could have done everything instead it's like oh my boyfriend for two days no, that was, that was just a, I'm sorry, I, I, I digress. It's very upsetting. Every time I watch a movie, I just get kind of, my wife's like, did you enjoy the movie? I'm like, I can't, look what she threw away. Okay, so the boat hits the uh, Olaf, starts sinking. There's not enough boats for everyone, but the largest life raft went unused. They could have saved Jack if only they had used the right lifeboats. If they took the time as they were sinking. Instead of screwing away from the iceberg, they could have offloaded passengers onto the iceberg, kept them out of the water. The nearest rescue ship was only two hours away. But there's so often that we are closed into, this is the way we do it, that we don't take advantage of the tools that are around us. So as marketers, we don't always have the budget. We'd love to throw budget at things. We've got to get creative and find things around us that other people might not think are valuable that we can use to save our ass or save Jack. There was room for both of them on the wood. I, I, I have a lot of So uh, another sinking ship, we'll talk about Blockbuster. A lot of people will say Blockbuster got thrown out of uh, business by Netflix, but that's not true. Why, why Blockbuster went out of business is because they got in the middle of a drug war. The real estate to own those corners where they were was much more valuable. And they didn't invest in Net Netflix, tried to sell the company to Blockbuster and Blockbuster said, streaming, bad idea. So instead they competed with these people selling little blue pills at very high profit margins. Now, this is another test for you. Is this person a Washington Nationals employee or a Walgreens employee? Very hard to tell. There's no way for me to tell. But if you're competing against these drug companies and you're only selling old versions of 10 things I hate about you, it's 10 things I hate about your business plan. Because here's who their competitor was competing against, the Qantas gumball machine. Redbox came in and bought that space that was a giveaway for charity and opened up 
the Blockbuster in there. My mom did not want to use Netflix, but she would use a vending machine in her Kroger. And that's what put Blockbuster out of business because they didn't adapt and see real estate was an overhead, not an asset for them. Let's talk about what advertising is. Advertising, if you think of people, advertising is a douchebag, okay? Advertising is what you're saying about yourself. Okay, if you walk into a party and say, I'm the coolest guy here, you're a douchebag, okay? Now, branding is what other people say about you. So if you can get other people to say you're a cool guy, then you actually are a cool guy. So we need to come up with things that get people talking rather than saying, come buy from us right now, we're the greatest. So uh, other people say it, it's the truth, we say it, it's just... Um, so promotion. Now the word branding actually, you know, we used to brand candle uh, cattle. And if we fed our herd better, if we had better uh, genes, we'd get more money at market. Now people are branding themselves. You know, when I'm on my computer, I'm glowing the apple. When I drink coffee, I'm turning the label around so it matches my Java jacket with the outside. When I take a sip, we all look like we're on a bad sitcom from the 80s as we're using our products but we really identify with products. So is your product covetable? I always say when we're designing a, a logo, would you wanna wear this on a shirt? Is this, is this merch you would wanna carry or is this merch you're embarrassed of? Don't put your identity on, on the cheapest item. Put it on the item that you would wanna eat. If we don't build up the brand, we turn into a commodity. And that is, that is just the dirtiest word. If we look at the root of the word commodity, it comes from the word commode, and the letter D, which is basically failing. So if you don't want your brand to be in the shitter, you cannot afford to be a commodity. Now we take a look at a t-shirt. A t-shirt's five bucks, three bucks. You put a brand on it, it's a $30 shirt. I always love this as a, as a, you know, what goes into a brand. Brand can be colors, it can be fonts, it can be a lot more things than just your logo and your slogan. Uh, this is an old Lego campaign ad where they took away the shapes of the characters but left the colors and we can still identify what brand it's from so anyone know what this one is simpsons how about this one south park sing the song la 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 teenage mutant ninja turtles america's first gay couple there you go so you know it's amazing you know people will come to me and say oh well we need something fun for spring well, that's nice if it's pastel but is that we're not just buying ad here. We're trying to promote our brand. So you can bring string into it, but you better have some consistent colors and fonts to help build that brand identity. So the value of your brand really comes down to dollars and cents. So whether you're an A brand or the brand really makes a huge difference. No one asks for a facial tissue. We ask for a... No one asks for a bandage. We ask for a... No one overnights things. We, uh, you, uh, no one bings something. We Google it. You know, when you can become the verb for your industry, now you're doing something really right. So how do we get to that? Well, we have to have a consistent message, but we have to have a message that can spread. Before an idea can flourish, it really needs a soundbite to take root. Scientists say at every moment of every day, there are six billion inputs into our brain. Six billion. The hum of the fan, the smell of the cheesy cologne two tables away from you, the feel of your shirt on your skin. But our minds block it out so we can only focus on what we tell it is important. Now, you notice this if you're shopping for a car. When you're shopping for a car and you find out the one you want, you start seeing that car everywhere. The reality is that car was always everywhere. You just didn't tell your mind that it was important to notice it. Now, we live in a really dangerous age as marketers. Attention is our precious uh, asset. But, you know, TikTok has taught us we can't even sit through anything longer than something it takes to scroll up. So you have this short attention span world. And we want instant gratification. We want fast cars and fast food. But when we're talking, it's just the opposite. You know, when we're talking, we want your full attention. It's funny, when we're listening, we're like, get to the point, give me the gist, 
cut to the chase. When we're talking, it's like, hold on, I need to tell you the whole story. I'm going to tell you a backstory. I'm going to sidebar. So there's this real disconnect from how we want to listen to how we want to talk. So I think a good rule of thumb is 12 seconds. It takes 12 seconds to teach a child the idea of patriotism. 12 seconds to say the Pledge of Allegiance. If you can't tell me the sound bite for what your brand proposition is in 12 seconds, it's time to get out the red pen or the machete and cut this down into something that is short and memorable and something that other people can pass along. Now, we can talk about the dumbing down of America as TikTok, uh, but it happened long before that. It was even before the tweet back to the newspaper. Remember when USA Today came out and they put the pretty charts and captions on and people would only... People like to skim more than they'd like to read. Now, we've always used sound bites and infographics to kind of get our ideas across. In politics, sex, and religion, a good sound bite can convert you a, a new prospect. It can get you laid. It can get you elected. So we need to do the same things as marketers. With movies, a good sound bite, a good quote from a movie can sell the whole movie because people walk around and say it. Does anyone know what the first movie is? Second one? Third one? Best movie of all time? Uh, third one? Fourth one? Now here's what's amazing. As you read that line, you actually heard his accent in your head. That's how powerful a soundbite can be. Last one's my favorite. Anyone? Yes, it's not a tumor. Who is your daddy and what does he do? Underrated movie, very good movie. Now, in the startup world, we always talk about elevator pitches. Oh, you've got to get your elevator pitches down. And the idea is you're on an elevator for one minute with a, a, an investor and you've got to be able to tell them all about your company. Now, I don't know where the fuck these people are in elevators at, but in Detroit, you've got like three floors most places, 13 if you're really lucky. So you don't have a minute to get your pitch out. You've got that 12 seconds. And now as, as marketers and people who are starting companies, we love to talk about our business and we all turn into Ron Popeil from those old infomercials. But wait, there's more. We also do this. Oh, yes, we take care of Freemasons, but we take care of retirees. Yeah, we, take care of, we want to talk about all the things we do rather than that one facet. Best example... I can see uh, of this is a person who's newly engaged. When they walk around with their ring, no one's ever looking at the ring and going, oh, that facet's beautiful, that facet's beautiful, that facet's beautiful. You kind of jingle it in the light and catch, your, catch the light in the ring and find out what's shiny and attracts their attention. So you need to do the same thing. Find out what your person that you're trying to reach is actually interested in, and that's the facet you want to concentrate on. You can talk about the rest of the stone later. Quit trying to educate when you don't have the attention. You need to titillate. When you can have a good sound bite that draws them in, makes them lean forward and hold the door open button and say the three words that every marketer wants to hear, tell me more. But it starts with having that sound bite first because there's plenty of people drawing for their attention. Another nice innovation that I like to talk about from a marketing standpoint, dum-dums. Now, when they used to do a, a root beer dum-dum, they would make the dum-dums, and then they would shut the machine off and clean it. And then they would make the cherry dum-dums. And they had a lot of downtime from the machine and a lot of product waste as they cleaned it out. Someone in marketing came up with a brilliant idea, the mystery flavor. Do you know what the mystery flavor is? It's the flavor between flavors. For the 100 flavors going through the machine, they don't turn it off and clean it anymore. They just put a different wrapper on it. So the mystery flavor can be sometimes root beer, strawberry, sometimes can be butt. You don't really know what's in that mystery pop, but it's marketing becoming a product, becoming a profit center. Target, every time I used to go into Target, it was $100. No matter what was on my list, it was $100 when I went in. Suddenly it went up to being $140 every time I went in. What changed? My shopping? No. They made the carts bigger. 
The carts at Target are way bigger than they used to be and bigger than any other store. How can you change the way that your customers are using your product? This is what's coming next. It's, it's not going to be pretty. Then you also look at what are you throwing away that is of value. They used to clean the floors at the Oreo factory and throw all that out. Now it's a valuable commodity. So what is scrap around you that you could be using to market your business or that could become a new profit center? Another thing is looking at the incentives that we use. A lot of times we have the carrot and the stick and those are the only two things we work on. Some speed cameras have uh, done things where instead of taking pictures when you're speeding, they take a picture when you're under the limit and then they will draw one of those license plates and give out a $25 prize for the month for someone who is driving responsibly. Change the incentives, change the behavior. Who wants to take a stairway when there's an escalator there? What if your stairway plays music now? You want to take the stairway. Uh, this is Lombard Street in San Francisco, one of the most beautiful streets in the world, but it also looks amazingly like Candyland. And so for Candyland's 60th anniversary, they painted the street. And now people got to play on it all day. How can you bring fun back into your normal business process? When you can change your perspective, you really change the ideas. I love to bring in uh, someone who doesn't know anything about a business and ask them questions. Because when you sit down with the client and you've been working there for a long time, you guys already know what works, what doesn't work but you're also looking at all things from the same angle as that expert angle. So anytime you can idiot up, grab an idiot, and there'll be a lot of bad ideas, but you'll get some fresh perspective. And those fresh perspectives might synapse something from somewhere else. The other thing that we have a problem with as marketers is we want people like us. We just, we didn't get hugged enough as kids or, you know, turned down for prom too many times, maybe too personal right now. Uh, but there's a virtue to pissing people off as marketers. The market is saturated with mediocrity. Everywhere we look, things are great. Me Too is a, brand, a terrible brand position. When people are starting up new, oh, yeah, we're, we're like Chipotle. Oh, we're like Delta. We're like, they're always saying they're uh, like another brand already, but, oh, we're newer, we're cheaper. Uh, and that's even worse because now you're just taking the profit out of the thing comes down to this idea. If you're not pissing off a few people, you're probably not exciting anybody either. Now in Detroit, we do the, the, the auto show is, is like the big thing here in Detroit. It is in Dallas as well. But when the, the auto show comes to town, they put out the concept cars and they'll build these incredible futuristic cars that look right out of the comic books. They have really bold lines and shapes and aggressive corners. And you will go to the display and you'll hear after people going, Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's so futuristic. And the other half of the display is going, oh, that sucks. What were they thinking? And so the designers and the marketers are there taking down all the notes of everything people loved and people hated. And they go back into the studio and they round off all the corners that offended someone. And so when the production vehicle comes out, the people who loved it are like, eh. The people who hated it are like, eh. And the sales are like, it's okay to piss people off. In the old days, we only had, you know, three brands of soap and three brands of toilet paper and three brands, that's peanut butter, that, don't use that for toilet paper, three brands of cars because we only had three networks. So we had to create very generic items that didn't piss anyone off because there were only three channels to reach someone. The media landscape looks slightly different now. Like you can create a brand that's just for furries who love pickles. You know, there's a market there and there's a way to reach them. So quit trying to create these generic things. You are not advertising on Monday night football. You are advertising to that niche and finding ways to reach that niche. Quit going for the like. A, the like is a digital grunt. It's someone on the toilet going, uh, uh. And then people are like, oh, look, our, our post got 700 likes. Wow, I feel the cash register ringing. You don't want likes. You need loves. 
you know, the, the difference between love and isn't hate, it's apathy and indifference. And that's what we're fighting because it's so much easier to ignore you than hate you. Even if someone hates you, at least they're going to talk about you. We just can't afford to be meh anymore. Be pointy, be a hedgehog, be something that uh, offends people because you know what? At least they're awake. I like to say when we develop a campaign, we want our customers to turn into evangelists and, and turn into that giant red pitcher of Kool-Aid and burst through the wall like, oh my gosh, I went to the best new ice cream parlor. It was amazing. You should see what they do. They have hooked with uh, nitrogen and they have all these mix-ins. There's a story in it. And so people start talking about it. A new, oh, wow, this soap store was amazing. They, all the soaps just sitting there, they'll cut off a block and they'll wrap it up and then they write it. It's, it's like being at a produce market. You know, there, there's a story mixed into how people are being successful in retailing. You need to build products with Remarkable built right in. You know, when there's an open house, when, you're, when you have any traffic coming in, what type of experience can you give them? Because brochures are so easy to file away, but an experience is something that stays with them. Have you ever thought when you're doing uh, an outreach program, take the, the cook from one of the stores and actually do a tasting? What if you disguised your booth at an outreach thing as a food tasting. Oh, is this a hot new restaurant? No, it's an assisted living center. But we treat our people like they're guests at a fine restaurant. Change the conversation because, you know what, a business card or a brochure is easy to throw away, but, oh my God, I had the best chicken all the king I ever had. Where, a hot new restaurant? No, no, it was the North ago. I can't believe it. But there's a story in there. There's something to pass along. The other challenge we have is we are all watching the same shows, we're all watching the same TikToks, we're all reading the same blogs and watching the same YouTube. When you get an idea in your head, you've gotta do something with it. This is one of the saddest guys in history. His name is Elijah Gray. He invented the telephone, but he was like 20 minutes late submitting the patent behind Alexander Graham Bell. Nothing wrong with his idea, he just wasn't first and ideas are perishable. When you have that idea, if you don't bring it to life, the muse is gonna visit someone else. And, and you know we've all worn our robes backwards, but we didn't all create the Snuggie. You've gotta do something. You gotta get off your ass and put it in a box and get it out there. So consider this your Miranda warning. If you don't bring your big idea to life, the muse will find someone else to inspire. And as you go back with some of these ideas at your next meeting, there are gonna be a bunch of people like this. The defenders of the status quo are going to hate your new ideas because that's they don't even like the taste of bacon. They're just assholes, but they, they have a way that they've always done it and that's, that's what they wanna do. And so you can't sit there and wait, well, I, I'm just waiting and, and what people fill in the blank is, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for my degree. Oh, I'm waiting for the new budget. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting uh, till my, my kids graduate. Oh, I'm waiting till I have enough energy. I'm waiting for approval. I'm waiting for a partner. And I hear it both ways. I'm like, oh, just too busy right now. I just, I'm waiting for things to slow down. And then when it's slow, it's like, oh, it's sad out there. I'm just waiting for things to pick up. There's always an excuse. There's always a reason not to do it. Your ducks are never going to be in a row. That's not ducks' jobs. They don't do that. And so you sit there waiting for everything to be perfect so you can act. And next day turns into next week, turns into next year, and that opportunity passes you by. Life is fleeting. As you get older like me, like you turn on Facebook and there's a lot of memorial pages. But there's also a lot of ideas that you had but never did anything with. Don't let the ideas pass you by or don't let your life pass you by. Whatever you're waiting for, it's your blank. It's your excuse. It's your lie you tell yourself for not acting on it and it's holding you back. So quit blanking yourself. Quit waiting. Start today and you're going to screw up. So start again tomorrow. 
Get out there and make it happen because the defenders, the status quo are no match for you. Remember, the ass most needed kicking is the one you're sitting on. So thanks for your time and attention. Uh, do, uh, how are we doing on time? Are we doing do? Uh, I, I knew what your industry was. I, did, I didn't get a chance to talk about what industry are you guys in. Do you want to? It's a fad. It's not going to. Okay. Well, how about you? One more time. Arrowed. So, what is is this like a consumer product we know, or it's inside big machines? Is it is it a consumer product we would know? So it's like an industrial strength whoopee cushion. It just okay. All right. So who are you selling to? That is amazing. Do you know the best brand on Twitter right now is a sanitation uh, district out of Ohio? Uh, it's N-E-O-S-P-L, -N I believe. Uh, when Taco Bell said uh, that they were bringing back more uh, Mexican pizzas, they just tweeted, we'll be ready. <laughs> but they are all full of snarky tweets and, and you know, it's a good it's a good industry to have fun with. What what about you guys? Okay. And who are you trying to reach right now? And uh, so you're were you B2B or B2C? Uh, am I out of time? No. Okay. Okay. All right. How how much time do we have? Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay. Two minutes each. Two minutes each. Okay. Okay. So what can we do with tax? I mean, what can't you do with tax? If you've ever got trouble code with the base, you're going to set up if you've ever got your one line cash or man, I actually have one. It's also what's holding you back from the next client? But none of your customers care. So, like, why why aren't they using you? What do they not know? Uh, yeah, I mean that's part of it. I don't think we we don't, you know probably like twenty five million dollars a month on the market for more than that. You know, I think that probably less than half of our market. So, uh, you know, we need to do a better job getting our name out there. I suppose. How about you hire a singing a singing telegram company? That only sings text messages. Hey, it worked for Elf, you know. This is for someone special. Yeah. All right, pumps. Was is there an industry you're trying to reach? Mining. Mining. Okay, but you're selling through distributors. You need more distributors carrying you, or you just need to help distributors move the product. So what if you reimagined 
the seven dwarves, but instead of using happy, dopey, sad, whatever they were, to seven emotions that are more today. And then, you know, Pumpy is one of, is the seventh dwarf, but it allows you to play up the industry, uh, some IP that they already know, some intellectual property that they're already familiar with, but allows you to play and, you know, you can redo hi ho hi ho it's off to pump we go and you know change the lyrics to be something be silly because silly gets shared around there are so few uh jokes about that industry probably that are going mainstream so if you can make a mainstream meme uh you know you have a chance to go viral there so phoenix phoenix at what age are you your older older graduates They obviously didn't get my memo. Don't, don't. Uh, so, you know, time is such a big thing for parents. I don't have enough time, but I also feel like time has passed me by because I didn't get my degree when I was young and single. So what can we do with time? Time is the asset. So how can we, time, 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 what's become of me? What if you uh, had someone really bad sing that uh, going through all the things they don't have time for their day, but finding a Okay. Could you partner with like an Uncle Ed's oil shop to, you don't have time to apply for a class. We will change your oil while you're filling it out. Like maybe you can, you know, for the cost of a free oil change, no one's gonna pass that up. But if they're able to, you know, meet with a counselor, that could be, you know, what kind of thing could, we give you time so you had time to do this.